Mr. Secretary, thank you for joining us. I, I think what was cool and I was talking about before we started was uh, you got to be in the courtroom because of this amicus brief, I guess. What, what was it like? What was the mood in there like? Because I think for a lot of us, we just heard the audio. You know, the mood was, uh, I think it was pretty somber, especially at first, because this is such a big case. Uh, if the court were not to rule the right way, I really think it would tear our constitutional republic apart. Uh, the, mood, the mood, I would say, got more lighthearted as time went on. It was, seemed pretty clear that the justices were generally, if not unanimously, in agreement that we can't have states like Colorado, we can't have uh, Secretary of State of Maine throwing presidential candidates off the ballot. I mean, uh, Justice Kagan, who is not the most conservative justice of the court, was even questioning how can we allow one state to make this decision? This, this doesn't make sense. Um, you know, we had uh, another, what I would generally call liberal justice saying, well, the, the 14th Amendment doesn't even include the office of president. It talks about presidential electors. It talks about uh, electors for vice president, but it doesn't mention president. How do you, how do you deal with that? Uh, very aggressive questioning of the Colorado attorney, uh, the attorney uh, Mitchell for, uh, for Trump, I think did a, a phenomenal job. He was he just stayed in his lane. Uh, no matter what the questions were, he answered them. He answered them well and then just kept on the message of here's what you have to do and here's why. Uh, the real turning point was probably when Justice Roberts, the Chief Justice, uh, started talking about his concerns with tit for tat political ramifications if this were allowed to stand up, which is really the, the focal point of the brief that I wrote that 10 other secretaries of state joined in, that's when I really felt like, okay, we're going to save the republic. We're going to move forward. Uh, the adults are taking charge. So there were several angles at which people were looking at this from, right? You, you brought up a couple of them. One is that the 14th Amendment enumerates several of the people that are officers, presidential electors, members of the House and Senate. It specifically doesn't get to the president or the vice president. Um, and that that issue was brought up. Then there was the issue, and I think you referenced what Justice Kagan said, I think it was her that mentioned, well, what if, or it might've been even Katanji Brown, I can't remember where, um, it, it, it was that, well, what shouldn't, what should one state be able to have the authority to dictate uh, the outcome of an election or who people could vote for? There are a couple other angles. Was there one angle that you thought was particularly persuasive uh, that you could see the justices reacting to? Yeah, I think they were really looking at the fact that the 14th Amendment, Section 3, is not meant to be self-executing. Okay. I think they were really honing in on the idea that there's this prohibition and Congress is specifically authorized to provide how that works. They, they haven't done that other than the, the statute that's criminalizing insurrection. Um, but there was a lot of talk about how would you know who was supposed to make this decision? Uh, I think uh, Justice Kagan even said, what is the legal definition of insurrection? Uh, so I think that there's really going to be a lot of look at saying this is up to Congress to fix. If they want there to be a, a, a path for people to be disqualified, if they want there to be a process, they're supposed to create that. I think that the attorneys for Colorado really kind of stepped in it when they were saying that there doesn't need to be that legislation from Congress, every case regarding whether or not someone's thrown off the ballot can just go to the Supreme Court. I think the justices did not like having to rule on this case. Right. And uh, they even mentioned, so there may be tens or hundreds of these cases that we have to deal with over the next decade. You could tell they were looking for a limiting principle and being able to say, oh, it's Congress's fault or Congress needs to do the work as opposed to they do, I think was a real winner with most of the justices. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because there's a lot of discussion about, the, you know, you brought up several things here and that the court didn't want to really be dealing with this and they're potentially looking for a way out. And I, that that's from court watchers. And the, the idea that they may be trying to find some narrow way of coming to like a 9-0 decision on a very narrow way of doing this without necessarily exonerating Trump or saying anything. And the one thing that I keep hearing is that this issue that you brought up, well, Congress needs to address 
how this would work. Uh, do you think that they are going to really limit how they the remedy on this and, and try to get to 9-0 and say, well, we're not really here to discuss the merits of an insurrection versus a riot or whether he did it or he's to blame or blah, blah, blah. But we believe that if there's a remedy, it's, it's Congress that needs to provide it. And therefore, that's all we're going to say on it. I think you are exactly right. That's exactly what they're trying to do. There was very little discussion of insurrection, and most of that from the justices was, what's even the definition of insurrection? I bet there wasn't 10 minutes on insurrection, probably wasn't five, although I haven't timed it. Um, there was talk, uh, as Justice Brown brought up, that the president wasn't specifically noted in that. Um, but I think they stay away from that because President Trump is different than virtually every other president, and that he hasn't held other offices. I think they're looking for something that doesn't look like this is because of Trump, that is comprehensive, which avoids talking about insurrection, which avoids even talking about whether Trump is a good person or a bad person. And they can do that by saying Congress hasn't done their job. And it's generally pretty popular in the United States to say that Congress hasn't done its job. <laughs> Yeah, that's a winning issue every day of the week. Um, let me, I, there was something that I always thought was unique about this. Uh, and I think it went unnoticed by a lot of people and maybe it's because it doesn't matter and maybe I just find it interesting. Both Colorado and Maine had Trump taken off the primary ballot, right? They were basically trying to say the Republican Party can't list him as a candidate, which I always thought was interesting because parties generally get a lot of leeway as far as how they conduct their business. Why do you, if, if, if this had, let's just hypothetically say that they ruled that, 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 that they have the right to do this, that Colorado and Maine had the right, this, and it, which I don't think will happen, but just play along with me for a second. Did they do this for a reason because then they can take him off the general election ballot, even if he were to become the nominee? Like, was there a strategy behind what Colorado and Maine were doing? Because I thought it was odd that they were really attacking what was generally a party function, i.e. conducting a primary. Um, in Colorado and Maine, the state is responsible for running the primary election. The state actually prints the ballots. So I think that's why the state got involved at the primary level. Um, in fact, there was some talk in Colorado when this was first occurring about the Republican Party maybe just deciding we're going to go ahead and have a caucus. and tell the Secretary of State in Colorado to just pound sand. Right. Um, having said that, I think it's good that it came up now because I think the Supreme Court is going to make sure that their ruling covers not only primaries, not only if there was a caucus type thing, but also general elections. I don't think we're worried about a piecemeal approach. I think the Supreme Court is going to make sure that this never comes back to them until Congress makes <laughs> a move. And that's good. Right. People need to know that they get to make the choice. If, 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 if Colorado were allowed to kick them off, you would see other states that would kick off not only the Democrat, but they would look at congressional candidates because that's where it would really matter. I mean, if Colorado, if California kicks Trump off the ballot, Trump's probably not going to win California, right? Biden is not going to win Missouri if Missouri were to throw him off. But you could actually change the makeup of Congress if Republican states said, well, these Democrat congressional critters, we're not going to let them run. And California said, well, these congressional districts keep electing Republicans. We're not going to allow them to run. And then you end up with not a, and not only do you end up with the House of Representatives deciding who the president is because so many ballots they've been kicked off of, but it's chaos. And yeah. we couldn't survive that. It's funny to me how willy nilly the left is willing to throw out the law for a short term game. It's not surprising. I keep seeing it over and over again in a in variety of um, aspects of our culture and society, but they literally don't care. Uh, let me ask, how, how soon do you think does the Supreme Court get will, will they give us a decision? I think we get a decision this week. Okay. It would not have surprised me if we had gotten the decision today. Um, I don't believe we've gotten it yet today, but I think it will be this week. And, and, and just to jump back, I think the, the reason how we can understand why Democrats did this is because they always believe that they get to play by a different set of rules. Yeah. We've seen that with all these lawsuits. We've seen that 
all the time. And and they what really caught their attention and why they were yelling and screaming was you had people like me that said, well, if that's going to be the rule, it's going to apply to both sides equally. Well, and I'm glad you brought that up because you were very out front and I, the media went after you. And I was just like, you brought up a fact, which I think is fair, which is, okay, guys, if you want to throw this guy off, for something that he hasn't been charged with, never mind convicted of, never mind no one in this country was charged with insurrection. You're going to throw him off questions about the 14th Amendment in terms of who was, I mean, like a lot of valid issues. Um, then, well, hey, why can't we do it? And everyone was like, oh, that's crazy. And I'm like, wait a second, why is it crazy? And I think you brought up a very important issue, which is why do they get to play with these rules and we don't? Yeah, and, you know, all I was really saying was, we're going to apply the, the rules equally. I think I was the first Secretary of State or Election Authority to go public on that. But that's our job, is to yeah. make sure that the rules are equal, that there's no thumb on the scale. And um, I think that just shows they knew how egregious they were when they were going to have to follow those same rules. Uh, my dad always likes to say that you back up the hearse and let people smell the roses. And we, I wanted to say, look, guys, you're going to have to follow these same rules. And we tried to do that at the Supreme Court. And I, I think it helped. I, I do. I mean, how important is um, a, a unanimous verdict, a 9-0 versus a 6-3? A um, uh, unanimous would be phenomenal. Uh, I don't know that we get a unanimous decision. Uh, Justice Sotomayor uh, did not tip her hand that there was any inkling that she would be able to uh, not the way that Justice Kagan or Justice Brown did. Uh, but even if it's just an 8-1, I think that's phenomenally better than a 6-3. I think just getting Katanji Brown-Jackson to to, uh, to vote, with, with that would be massive, right? This very, very leftist jurist to side, it, that alone would be huge under any circumstances. Yeah, it would be. I mean, the fact that we were at a case of that importance and as conservatives, we're quoting Justice Brown uh, right. <laughs> or Justice Kagan. That gives you a good feeling. <laughs> yeah. So the other case that Trump is dealing with uh, with respect to the Supreme Court is this case of immunity. Now, here's the thing that I, I was hoping you might shed some light on. Right. So he's claiming that, hey, when I'm president, I have immunity just as you know, and, and what Stephen Miller and others have pointed out is if 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 you don't have immunity for the actions you take in the office you hold, then you could hold, you know, Barack Obama or Joe Biden uh, guilty or charge them with actions they took that resulted in, in Americans being killed, right? The, the Afghanistan withdrawal in the case of Biden, which I don't think anybody would, would agree you should be able to do. That's nuts. There's a line that seems to be clear, which is what are you doing in your capacity as president or any office versus what are you doing? As a, as a civilian, right? So if, 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 our, if a president were to take a gun or murder somebody in some other fashion, you can't say that that's in support yeah. of, the, of their job. Where do you think that case comes out and how important is it into his overall legal strategy? You know, I, I think it's an important case um, because I think there's been a lot of working to find juries that frankly don't care about the facts um, that are anti-Trump. So I think it's important for him to get a good ruling. I think he will. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about the ruling. I hope it is narrow. Um, this is such, the facts of this case are so terrible for the prosecutors that they're going after a president for trying, in his view, to make sure that the laws are faithfully executed. That's part of the job of the president. You take an oath to make sure right. that the laws are, are faithfully executed. So I, I think there should be no doubt that the court will find that at least President Trump was protected for what he did. Um, I don't know that we will get an all-encompassing whatever a president in the future says he did as part of his official duties he has immunity for. Uh, but this is just such an egregious case that's been brought up against the president for speaking out about what a lot, millions of Americans saw as problems with how the laws were executed. But the thing that I find fascinating is, again, this gets back to, to your original point with the, la with the latter case, right? Which is, okay, guys, you don't want to give the president immunity, right? Fine, I get it. You hate Trump. It's a DC jury, whatever. Once you do that, 
then you open the floodgates to go after every previous president for actions that they took as president. And the left can't say, well, that's ridiculous because you just said that, you know, if this ruling were to come out and deny the president has any any immunity, that would seemingly open those gates up. How much money did this current administration give to the terrorist Hamas and to Iran and to their surrogates in the days and weeks that led up to the massacre we saw in Israel, when they attacked a race and country of people solely for their religious beliefs? And that, you know, that's still ongoing. We still have American hostages that are being held. Uh, There are case after case where this same rule will be applied uh, to Democrats, and they are not used to being held accountable. That's why I think the Supreme Court will be careful with this ruling, but specifically because the facts are so ridiculous that all the president was doing was saying, hey, there's there's allegations of fraud here. You need to look at this. That's yeah. not wrong. That's what we should want our elected officials doing, making sure that the election was counted correctly. 